On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Nilesh Nimkar. He is the Senior Director of Doubt. Sec Ops at Voice. We're going to be talking about an interesting subject. We're going to be talking about managing blockchain at scale. Nilesh has uh, recently moved to Voice, diving into the blockchain space, but he has a deep, deep background in security, DevSecOps, that is, and DevOps and infrastructure related work. So I think his perspective on some of the challenges he's seeing at Voice and just how he's dealing with what's a fast evolving sector of the blockchain crypto space. Uh, Nilesh, thanks for being on the podcast. Uh, thanks, Amir. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and if you could, uh, just to kind of help us understand a little uh, about you, know, you and, and, and Voice, if you could tell us, what does Voice exactly do? And then also, uh, dr- Senior Director of DevSecOps, what are your responsibilities? Thank you. Voice is an NFT marketplace. We are in public beta right now. We will be soon going to production. We maintain our own blockchain. We are working towards decentralization. Our blockchain is based on the EOS technology. We are uh, the first of its kind, a green blockchain, meaning essentially you might have heard that NFTs take up too much uh, you know, resources and are bad for planet. Essentially, we control that and we, our blockchain uses a, a very less resources. At Voice, I am the senior uh, director of DevSecOps. My responsibilities include planning and maintaining the infrastructure, as well as I'm responsible for the security of the infrastructure from inception to the delivery. Awesome. I mean, it's an exciting space. Uh, I guess to start off, I'm curious, when you first started Voice, you know, what was your experience within, you know, the crypto, blockchain, NFT space? You know, were you actively in it? Was it something that was absolutely brand new to you? That's a very good question. I had a prior experience with blockchain technologies, at least at some level. But NFT was a very brand new concept to me, and I had to kind of do my own research in that. And I found that very, very exciting. But having had exposure to blockchain, previously before coming to Voice, I used to work at Deloitte. And at Deloitte, I had done a lot of different projects. Over there, I had uh, some exposure to blockchain. and. Uh, with blockchain, I had, you know, blockchain and Hyperledger. Those are two different kind of, essentially same technology applied different ways. But that kind of helped in that uh, transition. But if you see, uh, there are several big players in the market and each has their own implementation. But if you see at the base level, the technology kind of works in the same fashion. So if you are exposed to one kind of technology, you don't have problems with picking up, you know, different kinds of technology. So it wasn't that difficult to get up to speed at voice. Awesome. I guess just, uh, you know, just to maybe contrast your previous, you know, work experience and, and joining a company that's moving at the speed of uh, NFT, I guess how quickly things change. What's been your experience in terms of being able to, you know, adjust to the you know, pace and potential just the dynamics of such a, a new industry. And then we'll kind of dive into you know, what you have to actually do to maybe make the, the platform secure and whatnot. To be honest, having a consulting background helps because when you are in consulting and specifically when you consult in the cloud area, you get exposed to a lot of different, not only technologies and not only a lot of different clients, but a lot of different domains. And when you get exposed to a lot of different domains, you have to come up to speed to do those domains when you are doing projects for those clients, right? So you kind of develop this art to come up to speed with those domains. And I kind of use leverage that to come up to speed with at least the technological aspects of NFT also. Now, it's not just the technological aspects of NFT, but the implementation and how they are being used in the market that is very, very fascinating. It all started with art, NFTs being used by artists to uh, kind of sell that art in NFT marketplaces. But now from there, NFTs are finding a lot of fascinating users. Initially, we saw them being used as tickets. They're being used as mementos, and now they are being used as used to form communities. As uh, you know, the most famous one, you might have heard the Bored Ape ones that they sold. But essentially, the Bored Ape NFTs, they have formed a whole community. And there are a lot of those that are actually for NFTs that are forming communities along these uh, basic concepts. 
And these decentralized communities is what is uh, driving this NFT space. So they are going beyond technology, beyond art even. And it is this community-driven approach to NFTs is what is driving this uh, whole NFT market. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, obviously the, the consulting background will let you kind of dip into that experience of having to dive into a ton of different scenarios and pick things up you know, super quickly. I guess the topic of the show, managing blockchain at scale and your responsibility, obviously, in, in DevSecOps is the infrastructure. I guess when you're looking at what you're doing currently and you know, previous projects, how much of the environment was Greenfield when you came in? I mean, I'm sure they have pieces, you know, but obviously there's a more you know, defined roadmap and whatnot, you know, potentially to be built out by you and then maybe why you're there. But touch about like what they brought you in for, how much was there, you know, how much of the roadmap was already figured out. Give us some context in terms of like kind of the impact that you're being asked to make. So essentially, even if environment is not Greenfield, like, for example, when I was bought in, most of the app was already built. But the advantage of working on the infrastructure side is that you don't have to make a lot of changes to the app to make changes to the infrastructure, right? You can always make the infrastructure more resilient and you can make it more efficient without making a lot of changes to the app. So essentially, if you see, at least from my opinion, there is always some kind of a tint of greenfield to the infrastructure. And the infrastructure can always be improved. And that is the approach I took kind of at voice. And that is the approach kind of I take everywhere. I look at it with a fresh eye and see what improvements can be made. We are always going through cycles of improvements for infrastructure. And it's a continuous fight. It's a continuous cycle of improvement that we do. In a startup, to do these kind of changes, there is much more freedom and much more leeway than at a bigger enterprise. That much I will say. If you want to make changes at that scale at larger enterprises, there are much more roadblocks. There are financial roadblocks. Uh, surprisingly, there is a red tape. And then there are uh, you know set frameworks in which you have to work. All of these either do not exist or can be bypassed at a startup because you know there is much more cohesion. And people have a much more common goal towards that which they are working, as opposed to a larger enterprise where things are much more chaotic, as opposed to startups. And that is what my observation has been so far. Interesting. What about some of the, maybe some of the technical differences? Obviously, your job is to you know, secure and manage the infrastructure from a blockchain perspective. What are some of the differences, just at a high level, you know, within this space versus you know potentially other positions you've had? Some of the technical differences is, again, we have a freedom of choosing a wide variety of technologies. Mm -hmm. But not only that, we also have a freedom of choosing a wide variety of vendors. There is much more acceptance of open source in startups as opposed to enterprises. And uh, the upgrade cycle is much more shorter. This all kind of gives us much more freedom to build much more, uh, you know, more resilient and much more stronger and performance systems as opposed to in bigger enterprises where, again, as I said, you are constrained by a list of software that is approved and has to go through a lot of approval and uh, security, uh, you know, review cycles. That's not to say that we don't do security reviews and we don't do our own due diligence before using anything. But those are much more focused, tighter, and uh, you know, uh, shorter cycles. For example, a bigger uh, enterprise has to do those reviews in keeping in mind that that software might get used across the whole enterprise. And then the shelf life of a certain software might be much larger than what we expect to use at a startup. And these are kind of uh, obvious differences that always will exist between a larger enterprise and a startup. I guess with that, just out of curiosity, so you mentioned, obviously, you mentioned the freedom to build you know, a wide variety of vendors. You know, going into context of you know, managing blockchain, you, know, you guys are trying to achieve a certain scale, going from you know, zero to one, one to 100. When it comes to selecting vendors and you have a greenfield opportunity, you know you have some complexities within the blockchain space that you're thinking of. Is that also a challenge because you have a ton of options? Like, you know, at some point, you know, you have to whittle down the list and uh, 
you know, evaluate and, and get a subset so you can make a final decision. But obviously every day there's something new rolling out. At what point do you go, hey, you know what? These are the best options on the table. And for now, this is what we're going with. There are a lot of factors that we have to consider when we decide to choose what tool to use to manage what. There is always the core blockchain and the blockchain is always going to grow. And you know, as we say, once a blockchain is up, it can never go down. And to run that kind of software is a complex task in itself. On top of that, a blockchain data always has to be available. To manage that kind of software and then not to kill planet, you know, the planet in, in the while doing that, it's quite a complex task. So we have to come up with creative ways to kind of deploy that software. At Voice, we say something that we have to size everything very wisely. And we continuously measure and size, measure and size, measure and size. And we keep on doing that in continuous cycles. So what we do is we take conscious calls and essentially the core management of certain things, we keep it to ourselves. But then for a lot of other things, I take a conscious decision as to does it make sense for us to roll out our own thing? Is it worth it to go through the pain of managing certain thing, rolling it out? Or else is it worth it to actually go with the SaaS option and would that be easier? So there is a trade-off over there of how many man hours am I going to spend either rolling it out and managing it and what is the return am I going to get in return to that? And then we can compare that with either a vendor option or a SaaS option available and then compare and contrast. And that's how, you know, probably I would come at a decision. However, certain core functions only we can manage and we have to keep them very close to ourselves. And that's kind of the nature of DevSecOps. And I guess when it comes to, you know, as you guys are scaling and you're growing, some of the complexities of, uh, you mentioned, you know, blockchain you know, can't go down and you do have the option of either you know, outsourcing or pulling things in-house. What are some of the things that, you know, as you guys scale, you'll be looking at, you know, potentially bringing in-house versus outsourcing? Are there anything that stands out or is it one of those where once it's outsourced, let's not look at it again? As I said, you know, we believe in a couple of things. One is size wisely. Some uh, Second is work smarter, not harder. According to this, as I said, we continuously measure and cut, measure and cut, and that applies to everything. So just because something is outsourced or we are using SaaS version doesn't mean it's like, you know, it's done and forget. We are going to be continuously monitoring it and then measuring it and then taking actions on it. And I believe that is one of the inherent principle of DevOps is that continuous feedback loop. And we take that very, very seriously. We are going to measure and then, you know, act upon the you know KPIs that we see coming out of all of our vendors and all of our tools. And there is no exception to any of the tools, essentially. When it comes to, uh, obviously, you guys are looking at things, evaluating, measure, cut. You're looking at uh, sizing wisely. How much of that sizing wisely process of measuring consistently gets put back into the roadmap? How often are you looking at it to make sure that you know, you're accommodating the right scale at the right time for the company? It is not only part of the roadmap, but it is part of each and every task of the roadmap. So it gets applied to each and every task of the roadmap, and we see that each and every task adheres to these principles so that you know we know that we are deploying and sizing everything wisely and that if we are kind of, there is no wastage of resources. And if there are resources that are getting wasted, then we spin them down immediately. Awesome. I guess, you know, you, you've taken a different, you know, certainly an interesting path to, you know, working for a company that's in the NFT space and, you know, your consulting backgrounds helped you. You're probably seeing some less red tape, obviously, working for a startup and the pace has got to be breakneck given the growth of the NFT. When you're kind of thinking forward and you're potentially going, well, where am I going to be in a year or two? You know, what kind of scale are we looking at? Do you start thinking about that stuff at this point or? Are you guys growing fast enough where it's like, I need to just really keep my eye on the ball for what's happening near term and I'll, I'll deal with those other issues as they start creeping in? <laughs> that is such an excellent question. Working for a startup, I believe two years is a very long time 
as far as coming up with the roadmap goes, right? Roadmaps are made for the year and then we kind of uh, split it up into quarters. And that's as much as we can predict what we're going to be doing. And that's as much as we can handle. Having said that, we have very, very tight, tight roadmaps charted out. And the velocity for that is breakneck. And charting out the roadmap also kind of, you need to also have like Oracle-like, uh, you know, predictive powers to predict, okay, you know what, I think three months down the line, this is what uh, developers are going to ask for. For example, I have a feeling, oh, the developers are going to need two elastic search clusters down the line because I saw a few developers having a chat on Slack in this room. And then eventually you turn out to be right. So these kind of predictive powers, and then you tell your team, okay, you know what, spin up the clusters and then the developers ask and then the clusters are ready for them. But these kind of predictive powers also come in handy. But at the startup, your predictive powers and roadmap can only go that far. I believe at least six months or a year is as far as you can plan your roadmap. And in such a turbulent uh, market and a technology as NFT, predicting two years down the line is extremely, extremely difficult. At least a technical roadmap, uh, predicting that is impossible. Yeah, I'd imagine. I, I, was gonna, I was curious, like, you know, obviously the change is happening so fast, even six weeks, let alone six months. And when you're looking at the ongoing changes, how much of your time, like, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure you have your, your day job keeps you busy. But how much time do you have to spend to keep an eye on the movement, to kind of keep abreast of, you know, the developing changes? Obviously, you know, the NFT side itself, you know, the business, that's what it does. But in in terms of what you have to be focused on, you know, do you spend time, you know, keeping up on what's happening in the size and scale of the space? In NFT space, yes, I do keep an eye on what is going on, uh, you know. And I don't mean as to what the competitors are doing and what the other marketplaces are doing. I mean, I keep an eye on the technologies and what other technologies are doing besides what the technologies are that we are using and for a very good reason. And as you said at the start of the call, the portability and multi-chain is going to be the next big thing. And that is very true because there is a race, uh, not only uh, from us, but from everybody else to kind of implement that. So, uh, you know, everybody is uh, kind of uh, racing to support multiple chains now. Mm -hmm. And so it is very important to keep uh, track of all the developments happening, uh, even technology-wise, with all the different chains. So a chunk of my time is spent in, in research with all of these frameworks and bridges and technologies and all of that. But again, as, as uh, you know, you rightly pointed out, I'm also very green in this field and there is so much to learn. The more I read, the more I know that I don't know anything at all. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously, you know, the change of pace. I mean, you, know, you see larger companies are buying, you know, trying to get into the NFT space. Companies are you know, acquiring gaming companies because obviously they see the opportunity potentially to move into the metaverse. NFTs are a big component of that. And then you have a startup that's building everything from scratch that all of a sudden has the ability to compete because the technology is so new. There's no one who's really done this for 10 years, right? So it kind of level sets the playing field. And I guess for somebody like you who, you know, seems to enjoy, you know, reading about the adoption and the growth, you know, when you're, when you're about to go to sleep or right before you're about to go to sleep and you start thinking about, you know, the challenges that you are just thinking about in your mind, is is there anything that you're like, hey, I I can anticipate some of those? I mean, can you anticipate some of those at this point because of the rate of development? Or is it one of those where you might be thinking about things that are popping up, but uh, realistically, you know, you have so much to do now. It's like some of those things have to be kept quiet in the background of your mind. (laughs) 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 No, not really. It's like seeing behind the curtain, right? Yeah. And I can see everything behind the curtain and you'll be surprised there is nothing exciting behind the curtain. Behind the curtain, it is blockchain. When people used to mint tokens and coins and all, it was still a blockchain. And now people are minting NFTs, it is still a blockchain. It's just that we are deploying different kinds of contracts and there is a different kind of uh, Web 2.0 front end, uh, you know? that is allowing you to upload different photos and all. But behind, there is still a blockchain that supports it. 
and the scalability options and all are still the exactly the same. What I am excited about the future is the different applications of NFTs that people are coming up with and uh, where the whole NFT space is going, right? And there's two camps that I see uh, forming right now, wherein people who are all in on NFTs and are excited about where NFTs are going and people who really don't understand NFTs. And so they eventually, they, you know, they just end up making fun of NFTs, right? People who think NFT is just a picture that you can uh, right-click and save and then the whole value is gone. So there is these two camps and it is very... uh, And that essentially reminds me of uh, the person, if you remember, who had bought uh, like a pizza by giving, what was it, 12 bitcoins or something? Essentially reminds me of time when people had made fun of Bitcoin and all the other altcoins when they were worth nothing. And they used to call it false money because there was not enough knowledge about it. And I think NFTs are exactly at the same spot right now. And people who are kind of getting into NFTs at all, they will probably either reap the rewards or probably not. But I am really feeling deja vu of that time. And I'm excited about new applications of NFT that will come up. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the core blockchains, I mean, I, I think we haven't, you know, it's obviously not the context of this uh, podcast. I mean, we haven't even scratched what it can do. And yeah, I mean, obviously that's, that's what you're really responsible for is the safety and security of that blockchain. And I joke with people, uh, I'm like, listen, there was probably a time in the last 15 years when somebody said, buy a pair of shoes online. You said, I have to try them on first before I buy shoes. I said. Just remember that. That's how we thought of buying clothes or shoes or you know anything outside of you know uh, functional goods. We we really couldn't get our minds around it. I buy book online, sure, it's a book, but shoes, shirt, socks, no. And um, I think that's just uh, with everything. I guess final question for you: When you're looking at you know your job and your responsibility, ultimately of making sure there's scale, accommodating the blockchain growth. How much time do you spend with the business to understand, you know, their goals, their mission, their velocity, the product team, what role, you know, what features they're looking to roll out? Some of the, I guess, stuff that maybe, you know, potentially could make your life more difficult as the scale mushrooms. Again, that is a very, very excellent question. And, you know, I'll, just as a sidebar, I'll tell you that in the answer to this question uh, lies the secret to successful DevOps implementations, right? And I have thought about this for a very long time. And when people ask what makes a successful DevOps implementation, there are a lot of answers to that. Some people will say there is, uh, you know, you have to have tooling. Uh, You have to have success, uh, you know, put a lot of tooling in place. Some people will tell you that you have to have cohesion between dev and ops and all. However, I seriously believe that a successful DevOps implementation actually comes from business pressure. And that is why it is very important to listen to your business folks and then for dev and ops and all the teams to be aligned towards your business. And that is why I actually pay very, very close attention to business. A chunk of my time was talking to business, understanding their needs, their problems, and then kind of removing any blockages that might be there towards business delivery. And that is why most of the successful DevOps implementations that I have seen have come in startups rather than in larger enterprises. Even in enterprises that have tried to emulate startup culture, you don't see successful DevOps implementations at startups where there is a, where people directly have to face business pressure rather than through various uh, you know buffered channels. Hmm. Interesting. I guess I missed up. that wasn't the final question because yeah, I'm curious now. When you mention uh, the success that you're seeing within, you know, DevOps implementations of startups versus, you know, larger organizations, and I know you've seen that, you know, a lot of your consulting. If you were to go back to consulting, and now that you're you know, fully in, invested in a startup, is there anything that you would advise those larger clients to do differently to help them adopt some of these DevOps principles better? Yes, actually, exactly what I said. Uh, uh, listen to the business pressure, and uh, you know. Anything that comes in between the business delivery has to be eliminated. I think that is a major driver towards towards DevOps success. That includes any uh, blockages in processes, 
any manual blockages, any automation blockages, if you kind of just follow that process, that will streamline your DevOps delivery a lot. And that is what my observation has been. But that is a factor that gets overlooked in a lot of places. It is focused either towards team cohesion and all, or process implementation or tooling implementation. Interesting. Well, that's some great insights. I, I appreciate you uh, being on and sharing. Um, I think you're in a super interesting space and you're enjoying it. That's the key because uh, it, you, know, you have to kind of embrace the speed and your desire to want to keep up with it, all those things go into it. And thanks for being on. If somebody wants to reach out to you to talk about anything, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, the challenges of managing blockchain infrastructure, NFTs, et cetera, what's a, what's a good way to get a hold of you? Is, uh, is LinkedIn good or how else would you like somebody to maybe reach out to you? Uh, the LinkedIn is the best way to, you know, get hold of me. Awesome. Okay. We'll definitely include your, uh, LinkedIn in the show notes again. Thanks for being on. And that's it for this episode. Uh, we'll be back again, different guests, different topic. And I always ask for two things. One, if you found the podcast interesting in this episode, share it. That's how we've been growing. Uh, you guys have been sharing it. So I appreciate that. And if you want me to find a guest to speak to a certain topic, feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn. Let me know. I'll do my best to find someone to address it. Until next time, goodbye. 